Ah, oh, salutations. I was just pondering an extension to my dungeon where I keep my most dangerous stories. But why do you think humans are drawn to explore dungeons? And what if I were to remark that you could explore a dungeon that knew why you were there, even as you yourself did not? Perhaps you'd think I was offering you a riddle. <laughs> well, riddle me this. You know the name of designer Grant Howitt, thank you. It's probably for one page comedy RPG, Honey Heist, a game about a criminal enterprise embarked upon by actual bears. But Grant is a man that contains, well, I was gonna say multitudes. Grant contains at least two tudes because in collaboration with the brilliant designer Christopher Taylor, he's created Heart, a game as rich, dark, and altogether electric as a jar of olives pickled in battery acid. This is fantasy in the same dank British tradition that brought us to the Warhammer universe. You know what I'm talking about, the kind of fantasy you read and you go, oh, this, is, this is all so funny. Why do I feel so sad? A campaign of hearts starts with your party of adventurers disappearing down the gullet of a tunnel network that's something much scarier than a dungeon. A metaphor. And ends almost inevitably with your group dying one by one miles below the ground. But that's okay, because you're not down here on some epic quest to save the world. Rather, Heart offers something altogether more pleasing. This game is all about you. You see, during character creation, as well as picking a very cool class, more on them later, each player states why they've come here, whether it's because of greed or guilt or dreams or ego or even the point of a sword. And for evening after evening, this game wants you to roll the absurdity of that answer around your mouth like so much rotten wine. You see, the heart knows what the heart, your heart, wants. In the tunnels of this living labyrinth, you will find, in one way or another, the very people and places and answers you were hoping to find. So if a campaign of heart begins with the players being asked, why are you here? It finishes as you come to the end of this organ grinder, with you being asked, was it worth it? But before we go spelunking further into the greasy valves and bivalves of this game, I wanna give you a bit of context because you see, this game is actually a sibling. Heart, you see, is set in the basement of Taylor and Howard's previous game, Spire. Roanoke and Deckard sent me all the Spire supplements because I asked for them. I regret nothing. <laughs> So loud! Both of these games share almost all of the same rules and the same authorial tone that's like a drugged, jagged giggle. And there are some cute supplements that have been released to let characters and stories from either game be hammered into the other one, as if you were inserting a square peg into a cursed hole. Now, let's just talk about this first game for a second. I actually reviewed Spire in Another Life, and it's also a game that delights in inverting some of the cornerstones of the fantasy RPG. Spire is set in a city that's a mile high and very weird, with touchstones of Mervyn Peake, or more contemporarily, Alex Fabie. The players take on the role of a resistance cell of dark elves suffering in an unflinchingly cruel apartheid state, a part by uncolonizing population suffering. of light elves. And Spire still today stands completely apart from many other fantasy RPGs because it is so funny and so grim. The game spells out that this is not a resistance you will succeed at. You will not only die doing this, you'll likely inflict harm on the very community that you're fighting for. But the game does let you make a gorgeous mess on your way out. Spire gives player characters abilities that are so powerful and imaginative and exhilarating and funny that no GM has any chance of figuring out what will even be a problem to their players in Spire and what those players will just giggle their way past like cartoon characters. Until, you know, they are finally, fatefully caught beneath the heel of the state. I love Spire. There's no claiming I don't. I have literally written the foreword of the new edition. But to me, this core book has always felt a shade over ambitious. The game has about 100 pages of stunning setting detail, 
but not quite enough on how to run a game that involves three quite tricky things. First off, it's about a city. Second, it's about community. And third, it's about clandestine resistance. All hard, the book does not prepare you for it. However, this is something they've since been like really capably fixing with supplements for Spire. Something I for sure want to give a shout out to right now is the Spire Conspiracy Kit, which comes packaged with the GM screen. This product is great. It is a toolbox to get your campaign started by the GMs and players collaboratively grabbing these pictures of NPCs and locations, building out a community that you imagine together, and then the players have to try and take control of it as a cell. I'd also really recommend the Sin sourcebook. This offers some very welcome details on the religions at the heart of the game's oppression, as well as law enforcement, which is pretty important when your players are gonna be mostly trying to break the law. And I'll also mention that Spire has some cute campaign frames to help narrow where your game takes place in case you don't wanna, you know, like unhinge your jaw like a snake and swallow oh, this entire setting at once. Anyway, I say all this to announce that as much as I love Spire and would play it again in a heartbeat, heart is a game I actually feel more comfortable recommending. But have I played it? You bet your pencils I have. That's the Queen's Quest guarantee. My friends and I played, I think, nine sessions of Heart, after which our story was brought to a natural end. By which I mean just the most unnatural end possible. Two of my players got taken out when one embraced the other in a friendly hug, and then before she could escape, entombed them both in crystalline wax for all eternity. Quince, that's weird and sad. No, listen, Heart the game does this to players. And Heart the dungeon network does this for player characters. You see, Heart is more than just a dungeon. It's an incomprehensible hole in reality that appears to be learning. It's not clear what Heart truly is, but contained in this nightmare undercity are creatures that are dark reflections of societal beliefs. Whole subterranean societies that are given what Heart thinks they need in order to thrive? And an endless trickle of adventurers that are drawn ever deeper by whatever the Heart thinks it is they're looking for. So philosophically, this game is as ambitious as Spire, but structurally, it's so much safer and simpler. It's just a dungeon. I spoke to the designers about why they chose this plainest of RPG styles in a section that I like to call, what were you thinking? I wanted to do a game that did dungeon crawling, like proper old school mega dungeon in a fun way that I could actually play because I hate mega dungeons. I hate that 10 foot corridor, then there's a room, what's in the room. And I wanted to strip that back to the bare bones and basically make a point crawl that you would create as you do it. One of the things we try to do in all of our games is every NPC and every player character should be in over their heads. We wanted to take the contrivances of role-playing games where it's like, well, well, you're the main characters, so of course there's something down this corridor. Of course this person's interested to speak to you. Of course they've got a mission for you. And we put that into the fictional world as a thinking being, which is again, doing its best in and over its head. The heart's just trying to make you happy. It will give you what it wants even if it kills you doing it. Yeah. So Chris mentioned that this game is a point crawl. What's a point crawl? Well, first and foremost, it's super easy to run. Where hex crawl RPGs offer an abstraction of freedom in the form of an open world honeycomb, but in practice, is a little demanding for everybody because players are in charge of their own self-directed fun and then additionally GMs are in charge of putting something fun in every direction as if they were feathering a vast hexagonal nest. A point crawl abstracts the world map into a more limited selection of more colorful locations. Simply put, the GM knows where you're going and you know where you're going will be good. And in heart, the points you're crawling towards and between are messed up little towns with distinct nasty little cultures and delves, which are the punishing journeys between the towns, with the idea that as you go deeper underground, the more dangerous and intense things get, as the GM picks locations from deeper and deeper and deeper in the book. I'm worried that sounds a bit restrictive. It's not, it's kind of the opposite. With the power of a point crawl behind them, a GM is actually free to design and structure a campaign in whatever shape they want. It's as sweet and easy as piping blood red icing. In my campaign of heart, I did something close to a straight descent because I wanted my players to feel like they were in an elevator to hell. But you could also do a fancy Metroid style world with gates and keys, or the little source book Sanctum lets you design a campaign around trying to protect and develop a settlement. Imagine Stardew Valley if it was totally 
podcast. Although I will flag that while you can design whatever shape you want, that shape does have to be small. When this book says on page 114 that Heart is designed for short campaigns of ideally eight linked sessions, it's telling the truth. This feels especially important to flag because the official Heart map they sell for sure implies that this could be an epic game when you go all over and you can't or you shouldn't. I guarantee you the systems contained in Heart will rattle themselves apart if you try and play the game for more than like 12, 13 sessions. It'll be like you tried to take a bicycle on the motorway. <laughs> Jesus! Ha! Ah, we got him. I just wanted to share, we've got something very special on the Quinn's Quest fan club this month over on Patreon. Here, check out this letter that somebody sent into our PO box. Ha. Huh. This is suggesting that rather than just putting my player's character sheets on blast, I show my own GM notes as well. And that's exactly what we've done. That's, uh, what? Over on the fan club this month, we've got a massive video where I talk about what went down in my campaigns of the games we reviewed in the first three episodes of Quinn's Quest. The Wild Sea, Lancer, and Heart. I talk about what I personally brought to those games, what I wanted to achieve, in the stories I told, how I did my prep, what worked and what didn't. I'm really not super comfortable with this, but that's exactly it. Our discomfort will lead to the big bucks. So, that's a... So that's a bit on how Heart differs from Spire. Let me talk a bit about what's been carried over from Spire, like an organ transplant. You get everything that made Spire great. Namely, maybe the best character classes in the world, extraordinary world building, and the Fallout system, which not everybody likes, but I do. So let's talk about those in order, and then I'll close us out by talking about Heart's new beat system, which is altogether too clever. So first, character classes. The single biggest tip you can give players to become better players is to be a fan of the other player characters at the table. Now in other RPGs, that's something you have to remember to do, but that wasn't the case in Spire and it's not the case in Heart. You are gonna love your friend's characters out of the gate simply based on what they can do. The Incarnadine is a character who's fallen into such catastrophic levels of debt that they have been anointed by the God of Debt as a priest. Their abilities relate to, among other things, creating or identifying desires. They have an ultimate ability that lets them buy anything, like anything, anything physical, conceptual, immaterial. It's theirs now. Also, when your Incarnadine dies, they explode in proportion to how much of their luck you've managed to use up. The Deadwalker died before the campaign began, but the afterlife regurgitated them back out for some reason. They actually get to play two characters at the same time. The person who the afterlife regurgitated is now back to life and a physical manifestation of their death. They can also dip back into the afterlife for a treat and even take NPCs with them, which led to the dead walker in my game meeting various huge villains, taking them by the hand into the afterlife leaving them there and then snapping back into reality. Every time the dead walker in my game did this to bypass a fight, my entire table of players cheered as if they'd just sunk a basket from outside the three-point line. The deep apiarist has hollowed out their body to become a walking hive of magic bees. RPGs are so weird. I can't get enough. An apiarist might spec into being able to construct anything they want out of beeswax, or you might spec into your bees learning to puppet your body while you sleep, allowing you to do stuff for 24 hours a day. There's also a cool ability that lets you use magic to normalize chaos, to make any situation you're in more predictable. I had a deep apiarist in my campaign, and let me tell you, everything she did was disgusting. The Hound is in the process of being drafted into an eternal regiment of soldiers that are stuck fighting a battle outside of time. The Junk Mage asks the question we've all been wondering. What if a wizard was addicted to magic and couldn't stop casting bigger and bigger spells? The Vermissian Knight is half person, half train. And that's only six of this game's nine classes. What this is like in play is like sliding a box of fireworks over to your players. Not indoor fireworks, I'm talking like bottle rockets and shit. And your players are gonna look at these things and go, we get to play with these? And you as the GM are gonna go, I guess? I actually told my players not to tell me or each other when they unlocked a new ability because I wanted to give them that superstar moment of saving the day by revealing whatever frightful new thing they're 
character could do. Turns out the witch character class in Heart, I found this out mid-session, but the witch can do something called scrying, where they look into their magic mirror and see three things that the witch player narrates to you, the GM, that they've seen are going to come to pass. And before the end of the next journey, you have to make them happen. And yes, one of the things my witch player narrated was a giant penis. And then whenever the witch encounters, for example, the giant penis they saw in the mirror, they roll extra dice on skill checks related to that thing. Next up, world building. As you'd imagine, the exact same wit and wonder that is to be found in Hart's character classes can also be found in the 86 pages of this book covering all the locations waiting for you down there in Hart. And I'm not gonna spoil any of them. Here's the thing. I think probably a lot of would-be players are watching this, and so much of the fun of Discovery, like this is really a game about exploration as on top of everything else. I don't wanna spoil any of that for you, so here's what I'm gonna do instead. I am simply going to flip through some of the pages in this book talking about what's down there in heart, and if you wanna read it, simply record this video onto VHS and then press the pause button. But suffice to say, if the character classes in heart are like giving your players a box of fireworks, the locations in this book for a GM are like taking a stroll through a haunted orchard and picking the fruit that you think your friends are gonna have fun with before throwing it at them as a nightmare obstacle from hell. In fact, I'm gonna go out on a limb. I think Heart is the easiest game to run in all of Quinn's Quest Season 1. Like, if you're playing a more traditional RPG that's about combat or investigation, you're gonna have to plan a lot to create a concrete obstacle for your players. But lots of story games require just ad-libbing from the DM. And that, I find, isn't less work, it's just all the work happens at the table. Heart, the fact that it's a tunnel network means you know exactly what players are gonna encounter next, so your prep can be very focused. But also, the players know that their character classes are built to be able to rip down the set of the TV show they're on and go exploring backstage, metaphorically. They know as a GM you're gonna be on the back foot. So all you do as a GM, all you can do, is pick maybe one settlement that fascinates you, a couple of fun enemies, a spooky landscape, then you're done. Next, let's talk about the Fallout system. So, if the cool character classes in Heart are what players think they want, the Fallout system is what they definitely want, but don't know it yet. You see, the Fallout system in this game turns taking damage into a reward. So the way this game deals with beefing a dice roll is that you take something called stress to one of five stats. Depending on whether you got hit physically, mentally, you got whomped by the cosmic energies of the heart, your luck runs out, your supplies run out. Which is how heart abstracts stuff like do you have enough torches, rope, food. Now whenever a player gets stressed, they also try and roll to get higher than their total stress to that stat. And if they fail, they take fallout. Which works just like unlocking a cool new character ability, except now it's the GM's turn. I cackled like a maniac every time I was browsing major Fallout to give my players. And in time, my players started cackling too. So there's this famous quote relating to literature that happiness writes white. It simply doesn't show up on the paper. Which is maybe why, as your characters start taking Fallout in heart, they become three-dimensional. Minor Fallout from physical harm might be you spitting teeth or getting angry, but physical harm is the vanilla stuff. Major mind fallout might see you step out of the room while the other players work out something your character did that you blocked from your mind, but the rest of the party remembers. Major fallout from the heart itself might see the next town you visit being a mirage. Major luck fallout might see you becoming responsible for a group that see you as responsible for their safety. Major supplies fallout might see you having to sell your services to just the worst NPC the GM can imagine. And this is how your character dies. If you consent to it, the GM picks from one of 22 different possible critical fallouts, one of which is bound to be darkly perfect and see you playing out an intense finale that stands a good chance of being cooler than how everybody else loses their lives. I guess if I'm being really charitable, I might describe the fallout system as what if you could level up twice in parallel? You've got good leveling up where you get new powers and items, and then you've got the fallout, where your character becomes more battered, deep fried, and altogether tasty. Finally, let's talk about the system in heart that Spire doesn't have. The beat system, which is just, ah. Oh. Talk about a rule that pops systemically, but also thematically. So GMs watching this, brace yourselves. Every player in Heart is given a big list of what are called beats unique to the reason they chose for why they entered Heart. 
and every player picks two beats that they want to happen, and this is stuff the GM has to give that player the chance to achieve, over and over again, until they do it. Now some of this stuff will only lightly involve you. Perhaps you've got a witch who wants to take major mind fallout. Some of it will involve a little prep, like meet someone from your old life who's trying to get you to give up on your quest, and some of it will require more prep, like lead a haven to prosperity. And this is how players level up. Depending on the size of the beat that they achieve, they unlock a power from their class of equal size. Which means, as a GM, like I had a post-it on my screen like I was a sweating chef looking at eight orders. Except instead of burger, it was like, be absolved from your sins by a higher power. Now that might sound like a lot. I thought it was gonna be a lot. It's actually not. First off, you don't need to hit all of these in a session. That would have steam coming out of my ears. You can just hit two or three of them in a session, that's fine. But more importantly, these beats your players are giving you is also them telling you what they want to see in the story, which is a gift as a GM. It's going to make your game so much better. And also, these beats give you a structure to hang an adventure off. Like, if I have no guidelines at all as a GM, I'm probably going to fall into the grooves and ruts that I find comfortable, which for me is generally a villainous lady with weird politics who means well but ultimately ends up causing harm. Thanks, Mum. The Beats don't let me do that. They force GMs to do a story that's much bigger, a little bit more rock and roll. You try and tell a boring story when one of your players is demanding they, quote, find the final secret you have desperately sought and use it to solve your impossible task. But also, this is so cool because Heart as a location is this weird hole full of psychic reverb that contorts itself to lead people to what they want. It's why adventurers keep coming down here, like insects drawn into a pitcher plant. So, you've got the players at their table and their characters in perfect parallel. Both are getting exactly what they want. Both are growing in power until these characters become so big and so nightmarish that metaphorically and sometimes literally they cannot fit back through the tunnels that they came through. And this dark ending is also beautifully lampshaded by the fact that your character class's zenith abilities, the coolest ones that you have to work the hardest to unlock, are going to kill you when you use them, usually. It is often the first thing that people work out uh, mm. when they're sat down at the table and they're making they're making a character they've got a character sheet they've got the book in front of them they go mm, shall i play an incarnadine well they'll die in this way people are so excited to die and i think like what it comes down to is all we want to do is have an effect on the world thinking about the zenith abilities a lot of them i mean the the kind of the default one is blow it up you know, you, you open your mouth, cough up, attack, nuke, and everyone dies. But there's other ones like establish a landmark or um, get married to an interdimensional eel. So the deep apiarist, where you can turn yourself and something else to permanent crystal, an indelible mark that you can make on the world that nobody can erase. Yeah, it's so counterintuitive, but turns out players fighting tooth and nail to unlock their character's own death works great. The finale of My Heart campaign was all four of my player characters using their Zenith abilities one after another like a team fight in League of Legends. They unleashed so much power they turned themselves into f***ing stardust. And all of my players looked at one another after it was over and said, that was the best ending of any RPG ever. You know why? Because players get two things. One, they get a finale of a power level that's just so exciting to them, but two, they get closure. That rarest of things in an RPG. Whew. What else is there to talk about? Um, the layout is really nice. The folks at Rowan, Rook & Decker did a great job. Nice use of fonts and box outs. I like it a lot. This is a real improvement from the first edition of Spire. And also kind of not a surprise, because if you've seen how nice Eat the Reich looks, the next game from Rowan, Rook & Decker, those folks are learning fast. And to say the obvious, the art by Felix Mial is obviously something else. Love it to pieces. Gorgeous and gross. Stop it, Felix. Next question, are there problems with heart? Yes. Like I'm really thinking here about the rules for healing and the rules for combat. Like 95% of heart plays like this imaginative silk that's super straightforward. And then when a fight starts or when players want to start healing their stress, suddenly they have to lock into this much more not even complicated, but 
nonetheless denser system that has this whiff of optimization. The weapon tag system in particular feels like it comes from a different game. Like this game, very intelligently I think, wants to convince players that getting hurt is awesome for the story they're telling and death is something to be excited about. But then healing in combat sort of expects players to be equally excited to internalize a bunch of logic rules to fight and heal effectively. And what was so smooth a moment ago suddenly feels resistant and wrong, as if you were striking a snake and then try to go backwards against its scales. Like, are we playing a game where my character is becoming a god and parts are falling off them and I don't care because I'm gonna get to the end? Or are we playing a game where I'm earnestly engaging with range bands and where I'm gonna put my hand on a player's chest and be like, oh no, 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 don't take that move because if you do that, they'll get plus one damage because then they're not in the range of my ability. It's like, is this game supposed to be subverting the power fantasy of the progress-based dungeon delving RPG? Or is it fetishistically honoring parts of it? To which I can only imagine Taylor and Howard responding, Yes. Also, I'll say it, I'll do some backseat designing. I think stress and fallout to supplies should have been a track that belongs to the whole party rather than everyone having individual tracks. Like an item breaking or you running out of ammo makes sense. You running out of food or your character selling a compass we all need because you're broke makes less sense. So yeah, while Heart has a few rules that don't all fit together completely perfectly, I still can't recommend this book highly enough. It's not just an easy game to run, it's a beautiful and beautifully written book just to read. My copy doesn't, uh, doesn't have that new book smell anymore. It's seen too much action in my grody hands. I love it all the same. And I think this book is just fine by itself. I don't think you need any of the supplements they've released for it yet. You see, they've just announced an amazing sounding campaign length adventure for Heart called Dagger in the Heart by legendary adventure designer Gareth Ryder Hanrahan. And that's coming with, candidly, just a disgusting looking GM screen. So if you do want to spend some extra money on a Heart supplement, I'd probably make that your first stop. Here's designers Christopher Taylor and Grant Howard paying it forward with a couple of other games that they'd recommend. The game I would like to recommend is uh, Kingdoms by Sophia Tinney. Kingdoms is a grotty, grimy, felt-tip pens and crayons smashed into the book game of lineage and of bringing things together to make something horrible and then go murder a monster. I really rate it. Plus it's really hard to get, so it makes me look cool. Just to add to that, Sophia Tinney is like an RPG designer that everybody needs to be paying attention to. Uh, the game I'm gonna go with is Broken Tales, a fairy tale role-playing game, but the world is inverted. So all the villains are heroes, heroes are villains, and the author of the book that you're in is in the narrative world. Stunning art, really fun looking game, and absolutely snappy gameplay. The British government are currently deciding whether Taylor and Howitt are legally too clever, which would lead to them spending the rest of their lives under house arrest. And troublingly, their next game, Hollows, looks to be even more British and even more of a metaphor. But for now, we'll simply place their heart into a chest of my own. And hey, Next time you go into a dungeon, tell them I sent you.